And that's why I went around Asia. Of course, I went to Mahayana and Vajrayana and, and Theravada. And, and I asked these big monks, very, very famous monks, about what is craving? How are you supposed to recognize it? Almost always, it was, it means desire. You can't want anything. Well, that's not so good. That's not how, <coughs> how this works. It's, it, it, it stems from the definition of mindfulness. And I ask a few of the the big teachers, what's the definition of mindfulness? Well, mindfulness means to be mindful. Well, you can't use the word if you're trying to get the definition. You can't use that word in the <coughs> definition. doesn't work. So when I, when I got out of Burma, after a two-year retreat, I uh, was rather disappointed with what I was told. And that was about, uh, well, it was a couple years later, this book came out, the new translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi and Yanamoli. And it was, it was done in such a way that it really made sense to me. So I started practicing the way that the suttas said instead of the way that the vipassana community was practicing. And I ran across one of the statements of um, the tranquilizing the bodily formation on the in-breath and tranquilizing the bodily formation on the out-breath, which is not being taught. And I started thinking about tranquilizing, and tranquilizing, another word for that is relax. But when I came back from Burma, after the two-year retreat and being successful according to them, I couldn't with good conscience teach straight vipassana the way it was being taught. So I, I, they were, in, in Malaysia, they were very excited because I'd been gone for two years and, I, and they knew that I was really into practicing. And uh, they were pushing me to teach meditation. Anyway, I couldn't teach uh, the breathing meditation because I didn't have a lot of confidence the way it was being taught. So I started teaching loving-kindness meditation. And they were used to hearing Vipassana Dhamma talks. And when I came out, started talking more practically about how to do the loving-kindness meditation and Instead of relax, I told everybody they had to soften their mind. And actually, the first time I gave a retreat, it was to 60 people, which was, I was giving three Dhamma talks a day. <coughs> and they all felt it. And because of that, 
I became very popular in, in Malaysia, famous. And of course, I didn't know I was famous. After a, a, a year and a half or two years of teaching at another temple, the head monk of uh, Brickfields, K. Sri Damananda, asked me to come and spend at least a range retreat at his temple. And there's a, a little ceremony that happens before uh, before the range retreat starts. And there's like 3,000 people there. And the way, <clears throat> the way things work with monks is the senior monk goes in first, the next senior goes in, and we're talking about number of years that you're in the Sangha. And this time, K. Sri Damananda walked in and he said, I want you to sit right beside me. And this is highly unusual. So he's giving his little talk to all these 3,000 people. And I was pretty new at being at that temple, so I didn't know a lot of the monks. And he starts talking about how lucky we are this year because we have this very famous monk that's going to be here for the whole range retreat. So I, I leaned forward and I started looking down the line, wondering who that famous one, monk was. And then he said, and he's going to give you a Dhamma talk. And he handed me the microphone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he says very quietly to me so nobody else could hear it. An hour and a half, that'll be long enough. <laughs> Not knowing that I was going to give a talk, I had no preparation. And now I had to talk for an hour and a half. So that was an interesting time. And I wound up staying in, in that temple for a little over two years. During that time is when I ran across the uh, Middle Link Sayings by Bhikkhu Bodhi. And I went, the first sutta I read was Mindfulness of Breathing. Because I'd been doing it for 20 years. And I saw that the Mindfulness of Breathing <coughs> had an instruction that nobody gave. Now, the, there's only four sentences in the instruction for mindfulness of breathing. And it's real interesting because all of the mindfulness of breathing that I'd been taught was put your attention either at your nostril tip or your abdomen. But that's not mentioned in the suttas. And you're taught to focus on one of those places. Keep your attention on it. And that's not taught in the instructions for mindfulness of breathing. And when we got to the last sentence of this, it says that you tranquilize a bodily formation on the in-breath and tranquilize a bodily formation on the out-breath. Now, I've been doing mindfulness of breathing for a long time. I've also been doing loving kindness, but I was real interested in following exactly what the Buddha said and <coughs> I didn't understand what it was talking about. Because always before, when I went to the suttas, 
I didn't understand what the sutta said, so I would run back to the Visuddhimagga because I was familiar with that, and I was told that this is the same teaching as the Buddha. But a monk came through and told me to put that on the shelf and just use it as a reference book and only use the language that's used in the in the the uh, in the suttas. And when I started doing that, I started understanding everything that the Buddha was saying in the suttas. It was like I would spend 15, 16 hours a day just going through the suttas and re reading them and having these light bulbs go off in my head. Oh, that's what that means. That's what that means. I happened to be teaching a loving kindness retreat and I'd just given a talk on uh, loving kindness so that people would progress very nicely. And as I was walking back to my room, I started thinking about tranquilizing the bodily formation. What the heck does that mean? And then my mind started remembering when I was really doing the intensive straight vipassana, I had this tension and tightness in my head. And I thought, I wonder if that's part of it. So I relaxed the tightness in my head. And I watched what happened next. And I didn't have any thoughts. My mind was clear. And I went, wow, maybe this is it. So I did it again. Every time my mind was clear, my mind was bright, my mind was very alert. But there was no distracting thoughts, there was no thinking about something else. <coughs> so right after I figured that out, I, I ran to my room and I sat for about two hours just doing the relaxed step. On the in-breath, relax. On the out-breath, relax. There's a distraction. Let it be. Relax. Come back. I didn't run across the, uh, the six R's until I came back to America. And one of my students, he wrote on a little tiny post-it thing. He said, this is what you're teaching. Release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. So that was five R's. I since added one. So it's not, I can't even claim it, it's mine. <laughs> anyway, I, I went so much deeper in my meditation than I ever had before, and I was considered a very good meditator. Because I could sit for long periods of time. And that's, that's how you find out whether you're a good meditator or not. But after a couple hours and going so much deeper than I ever had before, I started going, wow. I've really run across something here. And it is following exactly what the Buddha was talking about. So after about a week of doing this, I went to the head monk and I said, I've got to leave for a couple of weeks. I want to go to Thailand. I want to go uh, someplace quiet where I won't be bothered. And I uh, need to just do a self-retreat. And I took this book with me. I went to Thailand. I found a place that had a cave that was walking distance from the, uh, from a town where I could get homes around. 
And I would get up at five o'clock, I'd go out on alms round right around six, I'd eat my meal, uh, and then I'd start reading the suttas. And then after high noon, around twelve o'clock, then I would start sitting and I would sit till ten or eleven o'clock at night. And after two weeks, I realized, I can't stop this, I have to go. I have to, I have to see how this, I, there's a lot more to learn. And absorbing the, the suttas along with the practice that I was doing, which is not recommended in Theravada tradition, you either do one or the other. <clears throat> I wound up staying there for three months. And finally, Kesri Damananda had somebody come to Thailand and they found me and said, you have to come back. So I, I came back after that. But I started teaching more closely from the suttas. And what I found was when I read the suttas, people started progressing in their meditation much, much faster than with the mindfulness of breathing. And they, they it was amazing. It was truly wonderful to see. And I started seeing that there is, there is no separation from insight and serenity practice. They are one and the same. And I ran across a couple suttas in this book that said that they, they come together, they're yoked together, just like an uh, oxen cart. If one of the oxen is stronger than the other, then you start going in a circle. You don't go in a straight line. And if the other one is too strong, you go in a circle in the opposite direction. The only way that you can go a straight line is with the serenity and vipassana equally yoked together. And that really made sense to me. And that's what I'm teaching now. And that's what the suttas are teaching. So this meditation is a lot different than any other meditation that you will have heard about or practiced. Why? Because of the relaxed step seeing that craving, how it arises, how, how you can recognize it, how you can let it go. Now, when I was practicing that 20 years, if somebody got into a jhana, boy, everybody threw, this, threw them up on a pedestal. Yo, he got the first jhana, he's really good. And when I first went to Thailand, they were talking about if you want to get into a jhana, it's going to take you about 15 years of practice. Okay. And then I ran across some Sri Lankan monks and they heard that what I, I, I said, they, they tell you here, it takes 15 years to get into a jhana. And they started laughing and they said, well, come to Sri Lanka. It only takes 10, 10 years. When I started teaching this, people were getting into jhana so quickly that I couldn't believe it. Two, three days getting into a jhana? But it was a different kind of jhana. So it really made a lot of difference. And now, 
by the second day, if you're not really getting into jhana, then I start questioning you about what you're doing. What are you doing here? How come your progress isn't, isn't so good? But as, as you listen to the Dhamma talks more and more, everything will start to make more and more sense and you will progress. But you have to remember that you need to smile all the time. And you need to be gentle with yourself. Don't be critical on yourself. <coughs> Nobody is going to be perfect when they start out. Have you ever tried to golf? Did you have the perfect swing? Did you hit the ball and make it go where you wanted it to? Even professionals don't do that. It takes practice as you go and become more and more familiar with the six R's and how important they really are and you start understanding how important it is to smile and have a light mind. Then your progress starts to get faster and faster. So after the Buddha died, the monks got together and said, well, we're going to recite all of the suttas that, that the Buddha gave over 40 years. And they had Ananda who had a phenomenal memory, who remembered whatever he heard. And he could call up all of the different suttas. And after the monks separated right after the Buddha died, there was 18 or 17 different versions of uh, Buddhism that occurred. Uh, some were very much into, uh, say, the Majjhima Nikaya. There's a sect to this day in, <coughs> in Sri Lanka that they are the protectors of the middle link sayings. They're the, the, the sect of Buddhism in Sri Lanka that's taking care of the tooth in candy, the Buddha's tooth, the relic. And I use the middle link sayings. I'm most familiar with the, the middle link sayings because everything you need to attain Nibbana, you can learn in the Middle Link Saints. I use the, some of the connected sayings from the Samyut Nikaya for specific reasons, but I almost always come back to the, this book. But the, the sect that is guarding this book right after the Buddha died, they went off on themselves and they started reciting every sutta that's in the Majjhima Nikaya. And there's been a couple of suttas that have been added since that time. Now there's 152 suttas, but two of the suttas don't belong in it because they're, they're mistaken. One of them is fairly popular, and that's, it's called overcoming uh, a distracted mind. Is it overcoming? I don't remember. Removing. removing. Yeah. Removing distractions. Yeah, the removal of distracting thoughts. This particular sutta was more taken <coughs> and installed in here because of one-pointed concentration. 
and the straight vipassana. But there's parts of this sutta that are taken from another sutta, sutta number 36, and it was uh, the, the greater discourse to Satrika. And what happens is the Buddha was explaining his experiences with all doing different kinds of meditation. <clears throat> and he said he did this meditation where he had so many heavy duty distractions and they wouldn't go away. That means hindrances. That he, he it says in, the, in Sutta number 20, it says he would uh, he would clench his teeth, press his tongue against the roof of his mouth and he should beat down and crush mind with mind. Now, doesn't that sound like you're fighting with a hindrance? You're not accepting the fact that it's there and relax into it and let it be by itself. Well, in Sutta, Sutta number 36 in section 20, it goes through this whole thing about Suppose with my teeth clutched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down constrained and crushed mind with mind. And as you go on further reading this, he said, it doesn't work. He started sweating and his body would become very tired and uh, it just, doesn't work. But this is one of the, the sections that the Burmese really like with after having to do with hindrances about crushing mind with mind, putting in too much effort, too much energy, which is kind of a sad thing, really. But I did it for 20 years. And if you, you talk to or you go to uh, Sayadaw Janaka or Sayadaw Upandita who passed away just recently. Uh, they were real big on putting extra effort and energy into the practice. I practiced for a year with uh, Sayadaw Upandita and he actually told me that there's 50,000 seconds in a day and I want you to note 50,000 times. That's putting in way, way too much effort, too much energy. <clears throat> and that's why I'm sensitive if you're trying too hard, if you have an idea that you have to put in more energy, I'm sensitive to that because I know it doesn't work. So I'm constantly trying to remind you, back off, have fun. Don't get serious with this stuff. Relax into it. That's what this practice, how you progress with the meditation. Let go of your idea of what you think the meditation is and just observe. And six are when your mind gets distracted. So there's no problem with that. But right after the time of the Buddha, these different sects, uh, Ananda, no, uh, Anuruddha took the Anguttara Nikaya with his monks and they would just memorize the Anguttara Nikaya. 
And there was another monk, I think it was Kasapa, and he did the Diganikaya, the, the longer discourses. <coughs> and Ananda did the uh, Samyutnikaya. I don't remember which monk it was that did the middle link sayings. Shame on me. Anyway, they would go off and they would memorize the entire book. And then they would take a test on it. And the way they took the test was they would be told, okay, we're going to go to this sutta. And they would recite one line from part of the sutta and then you had to continue. And, and if you made a mistake, the people that were testing you, they already had passed the test. So they would stop you and say, no, you made a mistake on this word. Now, it's supposed to be this. Now, go on and repeat the whole thing again. You're only allowed to make six mistakes. That's with the entire book. Memorizing the suttas that way is the most accurate way of keeping the suttas alive. Around the fourth century, no, around the fourth Buddha's council, which was about 500 years after the Buddha died, <clears throat> they decided that you need to write down the suttas. And of course the first writing down was pretty accurate, but as time went by, things got changed a little bit. And then Buddhism going from one country into another country into another country, things changed a bit. In Burma, I had the opportunity to be with one of the truly amazing people in the world who had memorized the entire Tipitaka and commentaries. It's about 12,000 pages. And you know, when you're in college, you have a test and you have a test for four hours and you come out and you just, oh man, that was really a long, hard test. He <clears throat> took a test 10 hours a day, 30 days in a row. He got 90% of everything correct. Now that's pretty amazing. And I had the chance to hang out with him. And when he did it, it was in, uh, I think when he, when he finally passed his test, it was in 1953 or 54. And he was the chief answerer at the Sixth Buddhist Council. Mahasi Sayada was the questioner. He gave the answers. And he was in the World Book of Records for best retentive memory. So I got a chance to hang out with him for a few days. And that was pretty amazing. He didn't speak Burp, he didn't speak English, unfortunately. I had to go through a translator, but that's always a problem. But I got to ask him about uh, where in the suttas does it talk about uh, Upachara Samadhi access concentration and where does it talk about momentary concentration he said that's that's not in the suttas and that just reinforced my desire just to teach from the suttas 
So it was a pretty interesting thing. But the, the monks had kept the Buddha's teaching alive for 500 years by just reciting it. They work, work by themselves and do an entire book. Some, some people would be good enough to memorize all of that. Because of his doing that in Burma in such a late time after pretty much the tradition of memorizing all of that stuff had gone away, he inspired a lot of Burmese and now they're starting to have a competition in how fast they can memorize all of the suttas and take tests and pass. <clears throat> when he did it, it took him about 18 years. Now they've cut it in half. They can do it in nine years. I mean, this is amazing. They can memorize five or six pages and have it exactly word for word correct in one day. And then they, in the morning, what they do is they go back to one of the other pages that they are, other sections that they memorized just to keep it fresh in their mind. So they were doing that in the morning, in the afternoon, they were memorizing new material. And there's, well, when I was in Burma, which was three or four years ago, uh, I think they had 12 monks that had done it, had memorized the whole thing and taken the test. That's truly remarkable. But the Burmese are the way they learn when they're in school is by repetition and saying it out loud. So from the time that they're little tiny kids, they're reciting things at the top of their lungs most of the time, sh shouting as loud as they can. All of the things that they need to learn in school. So they've trained their mind how to memorize. And the Burmese are actually very intelligent. It gives you an idea of what I'm showing you is the higher training. And it does work. And it works very well.